Hey, boys and girls, Doug Childs here. It's Warriors Rich and Wow Man. What's happening, Doug? Smoking a Churchill, a Safari Cigar dot com dandy, and um, halfway through it. And and Rich, I must report to you and the Warriors and Wild Men listeners, it is perfecto, perfect draw. Just rubbing taste. it in. Mm-hmm. I'm over here uh, not smoking a cigar, and you're just rubbing it in that you're smoking a cigar. Oh, well. <laughs> hey, buddy. So, uh, cell church model. I don't know anything about it, uh, but I'm, I'm digging it, and um, I'm seeing the, the incredible benefits of it, and uh, especially in the age of COVID-19. <laughs> and uh, in these big government goons who are like, we want to shut down your church. You can't <laughs> assemble anymore. We're doing it for your safety. And I believe that's exactly what the Nazis told all the all the preachers and priests back in pre-Nazi Germany that they yep. were going, you know, they're doing it for their safety. They're here to help us. Yeah. And uh so um let's talk guerrilla tactics and and how to uh circumnavigate uh the tricky milieu which is called Bidenville. Yeah, seriously. I, I think the the thing we if you haven't heard the first podcast, you gotta go back and listen to it on this series. It'll help when we talk about the difference between when we say traditional church and cell church, what what we're talking about on this podcast. Basically, a cell church is a church that's based around cell groups, small groups, and a traditional church is based on a building or, or a central location. And so um that that's the basic. And and we went through a couple points last time. We're gonna pick up on point number three. And uh, point number three is that a traditional church has a come to us mentality. A cell church has a go mentality, meeting people where they are. So the traditional churches bring non-Christians to the church, to the building for Sunday school or outreach services. And the cell group is more like uh, meeting and reaching non-Christians where they're at where they live. So it's a go mentality versus a come or bring them mentality. I dig it. Yeah, because cell cell churches are in homes. Like we have over a hundred cell groups in Yuma. And so when people ask, you know, do you guys have small group meetings? We say, yeah. They say, what night? Every night. Where at? Everywhere. Where where do you want to go? Well, do you have men's? Yep. You have women's? Mm Mm-hmm. You have youth? Yep. You have children? Sure do. Whatever you want. You have old people? Yeah. You have young people? We have all kinds of people. We have some cell groups that are a mix from old people all the way to young people. We Let's go. I remember when I first got <clears throat> uh, gang tackled by the, the triune godhead. And um, because I was 21 and I was a you know a college student, Rich, I was put into the college group. And uh, of course. boy, I didn't fit in that. <laughs> in that crowd. And so what I did is that uh, I hung out uh, with Burr and Wilma, and they were in their 70s, but they were on fire for God. They were smart. They loved each other. Man, they had a killer marriage, killer kids. And we just had, you know, just like you said, just this group of people that really had a living, active, uh, vivacious cell group or home group, whatever the heck you want to call it. And that's where I fit in other yep. than doing, you know, concert ministry, uh, bar nightclub type ministry, uh, street ministry, those, those little things where it's like, well, you're this age and you go to college. Yes. So ipso facto, you need to go to this crap show and you sit down and you be a good Christian. You know what they're doing? I mean, they'd do some kumbaya type songs, but they would, you know, everybody go around talking about their feelings and sharing, and then they would play games like Scrabble. And I'm like, I'm trying to behave, man, because, you know, I don't know diddly squat about, (laughs) I didn't go to church until after I got converted. And I mean, uh, I mean, marriage and funerals. I didn't go. My parents, for whatever reason, they're like, we're not letting him darken a church door because he'll embarrass our entire family. Then, then I got converted and I started going to church and uh, I was blown away. It's like, this sucks. <laughs> this is this is this is a big letdown because I got dramatically converted, you know, from being a 
pothead, a drunk, a rapscallion on steroids. And then the, the, the living God infuses. He comes and just absolutely tackles me. And I get dramatically converted. And then I get put into the dramatically mundane. And uh, I'll never forget the advice that my pastor, uh, thankfully, he got me because, you know, he had a similar past. He goes, dude, prison ministry, street ministry, concert ministry. You need to go to this home group right here because uh, uh, you need a stabilizing older couple factor who's not, you know, the cold uh, water bucket brigade who's going to try mm-hmm. to snuff your fire out. He says, if you stay in that college group, you're going to destroy it. <laughs> yeah. When you, <laughs> but you think about it, and what do they do in church? They tell you, oh, man, you need to invite people. You need to invite people. You need to bring people. Bring them to the building. Bring them to our event. Bring the people. You need to bring the people. And it's like, oh, that's, what's wrong with that? Well, Jesus didn't do that. He went to where they were. Matter of fact, he didn't stick around because he was busy going to where they were. And then when he found lots of them, he said, man, his, in his heart, he's, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he kept going and going and going and going to where the people were. And then you know what he told the disciples? This weird thing. He said, go. We know God's in to go because two thirds of God's name is go, right? He's all about it. He's like, go. And what they do, the miracles that we see in the Bible, how many of them happened in church? One, two, maybe. All, all the miracles yeah. in the Bible happened in people's houses, where they were, where right. they went, where they found them. They found them and they have miracles. We don't do that. We bring people to come see the one guy do the show. And then we wonder why God doesn't show up because God, God isn't into that. He's not into bring. He's into go. He's into go where they're at. Yeah. Go be with them, right? And, and he loves that. I, I was at a, a biker bar. Oh, you, you, you went there with me to Hideaway one day. And I was hanging out with Annie and smoking a cigar, listening to some blues music, a couple friends. It was great, you know? And, and this big motorcycle guy says, Rich, come here. And I was like, this guy's waving and summonsing me. And I don't like that, right? Summoning me. So I went over there and he said, you guys, this is my friend, Rich. He's a preacher. They're like, cool. It's a group of maybe eight or 10, maybe 10 uh, guys and ladies, you know, bikers. He said, uh, Rich, um, since you're here, these are my friends. He said, it's Sunday afternoon. He goes, you got a good word you could share with us? And I was thinking, are you freaking kidding me, dude? Am I really at a biker bar outside, blues music on, hundreds of people, and this dude calls me over and asks me if I can share something with him and his friends? You gotta be kidding me, right? And I said, yeah, of course. So I started ministering to him for, Doug, I'm telling you, five minutes, four minutes. And then I said, hey, you guys, um, would it be okay if I prayed for you? Doug. They all got their arms around each other like a huddle. Here we are in the middle of all this. And they said, yeah, go ahead, man, go ahead. And so I got to pray for them, got to bless them. And they all hugged me and thanked me. And I walked back to where Annie was with tears coming down my face. And I said, that's one of the greatest days of my life right there. That's, we, Doug, we're go. We're supposed to go. Those, if I tell those people, hey, come to my church, they're not going to go to my church. Too many times we try to take people to church before we take them to Jesus. I got that from a song, by the right. way. But the reality is, yeah, is I think, that I think, uh, church is designed for Christ, believers. Yeah, I think Christ had uh, something to say about uh, that kind of mentality when he was uh, undressing the Pharisees. In Matthew 23, he, says, um, he said, you guys, when, when you get a convert... You make him twice the son of hell yep. than than you are. Than you are. So they're yeah. you, they're converting them to a system. They're not converting. Uh, they're not being born again to the Holy Spirit. Yep. You know, it's like it's you know, it's you need to be in membership. You need to say what we say when we say it. And uh, and you're talking about the stuff at the bar and and uh, all the stuff that you and I could go on for hours and hours about how when we were going. And when we're out there doing it, um, and I like it with Christ, it says while he's on his way, it's like on his way where, you know, he's yeah. just doing his doing his thing, and you know, his just way. stuff happens. <laughs> and so um, uh, I've seen a lot of miracles, uh, not too many contrary to nature, but definitely you know God doing some incredible stuff to people, 
physical healing, uh, exorcisms, uh, words of knowledge, uh, discerning of spirits. And most of it had nothing to do with the church whatsoever. It was in a very unfriendly environment if you were wrong or if you messed up. And this guy the other day, he was at uh, Cigars and Sermons and we were talking about uh, going and laying hands on people, you know, regardless of, you know, what, you know, COVID-19 is telling us to do. And he said, he goes, I've been in church for 20 plus years. I have never seen God do any of that stuff ever. And that's some sad stuff. That's man. real sad. And, and then, but I, you, you touched on something that I think is important too. Warriors and Wildman listeners hearing this, and they're thinking, well, yeah, that's because that's rich. That's Doug. No, no, that's wrong. We're just people. And you say, well, you're a pastor. Doug's a pastor. You know, you've been trained in ministry. That's true. But you want to know something? That has nothing to do with us being called to go and reaching the people that we go, that we experience in life. Because I promise you, every single person that's listening, you have access to people that I'll never meet, that Doug yeah. will never meet. And not only that, God designed you to reach those people, not us. You don't need to bring them to us, bring them to the professional. You need to go, but I don't know what to say. You know what? It's okay. Go there and just love them. Listen to them. Yeah. Listen to their life. Ask them if you could pray for them. I don't know how to pray. Ask God to help them. That's praying. It, it, we have yeah. made it this professional thing, and it was never designed to be like that. It was supposed to be people just loving God and loving people. And now let's just go to the people that were around, and let's just be the church. Hello. I like that. No, but yeah, again, and it and it pushes a person. I mean, like before, I was a professional. I don't even, <laughs> I don't even know if I'm professional at all. I, I don't, I don't view myself like that whatsoever. And um, I'm just, I'm just a hungry uh, one of God's adopted special boys, and um, trying to uh, hear as best as I can what He wants me to do and say. But you know, when I first got converted, and I'm going to uh, Texas Tech. And I'm walking across the campus, going to art school and stuff. And on the way in, it's like, Lord, open the doors, open the doors. Give me whomever you want me to talk to, professor, student. Uh, if they start slamming Christianity uh, during English lit class or during one of <laughs> a critique of my artwork, then give me the boldness to not be ashamed of you. Uh, you know, Holy Spirit, fill me. And that, that was the daily occurrence, man. And right. it was like, you know, just a heat seeking missile. Yep. And I didn't I didn't know what to say. A lot of times I said weird crap and heretical stuff and you know, just <laughs> something I glammed off the radio. But it says in Matthew ten is that uh don't prep anything. He says, When when you get uh ready to open your mouth, I'm gonna fill it at that time with what you need to say. And you just need to believe that, you know, just yep. waddle out there. Get in, the, get in the midst of a bunch of people because this is pure harvest conditions right now, folks. When you see, when Jesus saw people, you know, helpless and harassed, distressed and in debt, he says, uh, the harvest is humongous, please. Yeah. We don't have to pray. We don't have to pray, Lord, bring in the harvest. He's like, you need to pray for people to get off, up, get off their ass and start preaching because it's low hanging fruit. Pray that's for workers, right? Yeah. That's Don't it. Pray that's for the harvest. Doug, that's know. that's number five. And this is the time. This is the perfect environment. You're right. Listen to number five. You're gonna love this. Traditional church focus. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Nope. Number four. Sorry. Traditional church. The pastor has the role of shepherd. Everybody's like, yeah, well, that's good. What's wrong with that? Don't get too bent on the term shepherd. See how we're applying it here. In a cell church, the pastor has the role of a rancher guiding many shepherds or an over shepherd, you could call it. And so in a, in a traditional church, the pastor is the shepherd and everybody else is just the sheep. But you know, we teach in our church, Doug, that we're a kingdom of priests, that the church are the, are the shepherds and the people in the world are the sheep. Jesus said, look, they're like sheep without a shepherd. He wasn't talking about the church. He was talking about lost people. And then he says, just what you referred to, pray that the Lord of the harvest, that he would send laborers into the harvest, that he would send workers into the harvest. 
in a traditional church, the pastor is the shepherd and then everybody comes to him for care. But in a cell church, the pastor... Then he, then he, goes, then he goes bald prematurely and he drops dead uh, at 55 or... Yeah, and everybody 60. tells him he didn't have faith, right? Right. After they beat the hell <laughs> out work, of him and his family. And work him to death and destroy right. his house and family and stuff. 100%. But then you have a cell church where the pastor trains the leaders to be shepherds of the people. Then the church sees themselves as the ministers to the people in the city. It's a, it, is a, it sounds simple. You, you brought that up on the last podcast, that it sounds obvious, sounds simple, but it's not. It sounds simple, but when you think about it, it's like, well, yeah, of course. But when you think about it, it's not happening. So we got to have the people in the church going to the people in the city and caring for them and taking care of them and thinking of themselves as leaders, not as I got to take you, you know, it's not like some invasion. I got to take you to my leader, you know? Right. Yeah. And who wants to be the stupid guru? You know, I hate that. No, it's empowering. I mean, you, you, uh, I mean, look at the scallywags that, that Christ gave the keys of the kingdom to They're rough cussing fishermen, tax cheats, political zealots. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think anybody in my, I don't think anybody in my church puts me up on a pedestal too many times. I think I've, I've disappointed them enough times just in my life that they're like, yeah, he's not on a pedestal. He's like us. Maybe we could do it too. So I'm just down there in the trenches with the people living life going, come on, let's keep loving Jesus. Let's go. And and we keep fighting together. We had a group of, uh, uh, had a couple of buddies, uh, go hunt a ranch, uh, recently. And, and, um, the people that, uh, uh, that we mutually know, uh, they're like, Doug's a pastor. And, um, they're like, yeah, I'm, I don't consider myself a pastor folks. Uh, I, I just teach. That's just what I do. You're man. pastoring people and, right um, now. Yeah. But so they're like, I would go to that. Ch- if, if that church was near here, I would go to that church. Yep. Cause he never said anything about being a pastor Talk to us about God, talk to us about yep. movies, talk to us about hunting, guns, uh, loads and optics and all that other stuff. And it wasn't just, you know, I come in as this rigid dipstick, you know, that everybody's got to mind their pints and quarts around me because I'm the pastor and stuff. And uh, I, I find it, you know, again, you know, horribly refreshing uh, if you just minister just tell people the truth, reach out to them. People are freaking hurting right now. Mario Murillo said that his tent uh, beatings that he's doing in California, which is completely unconventional, unless you're a Pentecostal from, you know, the thirties or the forties <laughs> yeah. or fifties and stuff. He said, he's seen God move just massively. Kids are coming to it, weeping, broken. And I'm telling you, man, I, I really think that, uh, you know, if we could put any message out there, it's like, what do we do? What do we do? How do we position ourselves? Uh, get on fire for God mm. and, uh, and preach to people. They're hurting right now, man. They are, they, Christians don't know what to do, and they're supposedly tied into the God of that, heaven. Can you I, imagine I, think somebody... I know what you mean when you say preach. I, I know what you mean when you say preach, but I think maybe the warriors and wild men hearing that, they think preaching like somebody on a stage. But, but I, I, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying, Hey, share the word, share what God's right. showing you, share your life. Yeah. Share, share your Jesus story, man. People. Yeah. 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 That's one of the, one of the greatest things that, uh, I was taught as a young, uh, up and coming minister. It's like, if you run out of something to talk about, always go back to your story because, <laughs> And uh, that's very easy to remember. So, you know, just like the blind guy when they're trying to incriminate Jesus on on healing him on a particular day mm-hmm. and whether whether or not he's the Messiah or not. And they come up to the old blind Bartimaeus. I think that's who it was. And they're like, is this the son of God? And it's like, I don't know, man. All I know is I was blind. Now I see. Boom. And that's that's your you got to have your story in a nutshell condensed to that. I was a teenage drug addict. One audition away from the lead role in Beavis and Budhead. I had no <laughs> desire to become a Christian. I thought they were pussies. It looked boring to me. I was focused on sex, drugs, and rock and roll and fast cars. Thank you very much. And he clocked me out of nowhere. And I got radically converted on December 7th, 1983. And there's no atheist around here, any kind of agnostic that can try to 
dissuade me from what occurred that day right. because it supernaturally happened and radically altered my life. Haven't been a perfect person, but uh, who is? But that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Love it, man. That's it. It's just a story as simple as that. People just share their story. All right, number five. You're going to like this, Doug. You ready? Hit me. Traditional, traditional church focuses on adding members. Cell church focuses on adding leaders. So the whole concept of cell church is winning souls and making disciples, right? So the vision is win souls, make disciples. The goal is every believer, check this out, would be a leader of leaders. That sounds simple. That's crazy. The vision, win souls, make disciples. You, there's whole Bible college classes on writing your vision statement. They're all longer, way longer, way suckier versions of win souls and make disciples, right? The goal that every believer would be a leader of leaders. Man, that's generational cell groups. I'm not only going to win people to Jesus, the people that I'm win, that I win, I'm going to help train them up to be a leader. Right. So that they can lead leaders. Isn't that powerful? Yeah, and it's uh, to me, it's an, uh, an appreciation of the individual call on a, a guy or a gal that, again, is you know more confused than a termite and a yo-yo currently because they're not <laughs> uh, connected with Christ, is that we don't see them as, oh, you poor sinner. It's like, you could be the next Apostle Paul. You could be the next yep. Mary Magdalene. Uh, you could, and looking at people as leadership material instead of some kind of sheep to be sheared, <laughs> yep, to, that's to, right. Uh, to uh, you know, supply and supplant uh, uh, your leader role, or not supplant, but supply and and uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Rich embellish. That's a good one. You know, your lead yep. over the people. To me, I want more leaders because you know what? I like to paint. Also, I don't like to just do church stuff all the time. I like to go on vacation and every now and then and yep. pursue game animals. And you can't do that, you know, if you're the big dog. And Moses was told by his father-in-law, he's like, if everything's on you, and if you don't raise up leaders, you know, captains of tens, fifties, and hundred, mm -hmm. guess what, Moses? You're going to drop dead. Yep. You know, you've got to yeah. look at these people as freaking leaders. Yes. It doesn't mean that they're leaders, you know, in, in, in church life. It means that they're... Uh, leaders in whatever sphere of influence that God's called them to, but you treat them this again, this, just like, you know, youth group, you treat them like they are going to become something epic in yep. God's eyes. And you don't separate them and give them pizza and skits and lollipops and stupid, uh, uh, Christian, uh, <laughs> uh, dramas or whatever. You treat them like they're going to be the next Paul Bunyan yep. with a fricking, blue ox and a big old ax to grind for Jesus, you know? Well, and, and here's another thing too, is that I think a lot of people think, well, I'll never be that great. I'll never be like you said, like uh, Mary Magdalene or the apostle Paul. But the reality is uh, I'll tell you what you can do. You can lead a small group of believers. You can get together and lead some people and pray for them and study the Bible with them. You can, you can, uh, Train them in leadership as you're trained. You can surely do that. You know, there was a girl, I read a story about her. She was at a church in Louisiana. And I think she was 15 or 16, but she was um, uh, mentally handicapped. Down syndrome. And she was in a church that they said every believer could be a leader. And she said, well, I want to be one. And they said, okay. Hmm. So they started trying That's to train awesome. her the best they could, right? Well, they had to have somebody there with her to coach her. This girl had 20 people coming to her. She was in high school to her Bible study every week that she was leading. She was seriously mentally handicapped, but she loved Jesus, had to have somebody there helping her. But they said, hey, when we say every believer can be yeah, a leader man. of leaders, they said, hey, with the help of the Holy Spirit, every person. Look, I think we, have, we, we probably have to define leadership. Too many people think leadership is what they see on stage at church or what they see in a business. Leadership is just helping somebody that's not as far ahead as you are. It's just giving them a hand and pulling them up to where you are. 
And then because we all, our goal is that we all have a Paul and we all have a Timothy. We have a Paul who's leading us and teaching us, pulling us higher. And then we got our hand back, grabbing a hold of somebody else and taking them with us. All we have to do is right. help. Look, if you got saved yesterday, you're ahead of how many people in the world today? Yeah. This concept of, I have to know everything. You know what? People ask me questions. You know, Doug, we've talked about this. People ask questions that I don't know the answer to. That's people's biggest fear. I'm like, if that's your biggest fear, get over it. There's a lot of questions you don't know the answer to. I say this. I go, I don't know. Remember one time you asked me, Doug, you said, have you ever read this book? And I said, no. You said, you haven't read this book? I said, no. You said, I can't believe. I said, Doug, I, I don't know what to tell you. I have not read the book. I tell me what it is. I'll read it. I have not read the book. You only can know what you know. You, there's a whole bunch of things you don't know. So don't let the devil make you afraid of I couldn't lead a small Bible study with a group of people and talk to them about Jesus because somebody might ask me something I don't know. There's no might. Somebody definitely will ask you stuff that you don't know. But that doesn't disqualify you. <clears throat> yeah, and for, for people like, well, I don't know if I could be a leader and, you know, because of my past or my ignorance or something like that. Uh, Peter, again, Peter and John were unlearned and untrained fishermen yep and uh and th that was held over their heads and they became you know the freaking lightning rod of the explosion yeah. of the church in the book of acts mary magdalene uh girls and i write about her in my book biblical badasses the women she had demons hanging off her like bats and yep. christ used her to preach his resurrection to the unbelieving disciples who had hauled ass from that environment trying to save their backside. Yes. And so uh, if here's here's how you know whether God's gonna make you a leader or not. Y'all ready, people? You taking notes? Do you have your journal out? Write this down. If you're base, if you're corrupt, if you're not that smart, uh, if you're full of weaknesses, <laughs> then guess what? You are the one that God's gonna choose. Yep. Uh, if you're least, if you're last, if you're lost, if you're back of the line, nobody's looking at you, nobody's gonna pick you. That's who God chooses. If you're a murderer, oh, you're perfect material uh, to lead and build churches, just like the Apostle Paul was. Are you a whore? Have you been uh, sleeping around with a bunch of dudes? And uh, yeah, you could be the one that spearheads the the expansion of the kingdom of God in unknown territories, just like old Rahab was. So yep. this stuff about like, you know, could I be a leader? It's like, God's not looking to anybody. When people like, well, I can't do this, and but I can't, but I, but I, and God's not arguing with anybody. It's like, I, I know full well uh, your incapabilities. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm telling you, this is what you're gonna do. What do you have? Yes. I have a stick. Great, we're gonna use that stick. What do you have? I got a... <laughs> And that's, you know, folks, I can't believe that I've done what I've done in my lifetime. The only thing that I can attribute it to is God's grace. Yes. And him uh, and me saying yes to when he asked me to do something. And that's, that's it. It's you know, beautiful. It's not like, am I perfect? Hell no. Uh, do, I, do I fall? Quite often, you know. Uh, <laughs> is God good and gracious? You bet. And, um, and he'll use you, man. All you have to do is say, here I, here I am, Lord, send me. You ain't got that many friends around here, so I'll help you out. Just, I'm weak, make me strong. So That's good, man. That's so good. And, and that's what we need to get. That's what people need to understand. Because a, a traditional church is trying to get people in the doors. They don't care if they get them from the church down the street. They're not interested in, in increasing the kingdom. They just want to increase right. their kingdom. So they just want to increase members. They don't care. But I'll tell you what, a cell church wants to add leaders. Now, I had a guy ask me one time, Doug, he said, Rich, where did you get all these awesome leaders in your church? Another pastor. I said, well, I just drive around town in my car and I go, look, there's one over there. Let's go get him. And he goes, what's that supposed to mean? I said, bro, we don't find leaders. We make leaders. It's good. We, we win people and then we disciple them and we train them to be leaders. It's, it's our goal from the yeah, beginning. I don't think um, I don't think a lot of churches, uh, traditional churches, roll like that. Again, it's like you come in here, you listen to me, you you know you uh, behave, you come do regular attendance instead of like this 
is a basic training camp. You yep. understand? That's right. And we're here to make you uh, Delta Force. We're here to make you, you know, spiritual army rangers. We're here to make you uh, Navy SEALs for Christ. Yeah. And uh, whatever your gift, whatever your fit and function in the body, the whoop and warp of uh, whatever God's call is on your life, we're going to dig it out and we're going to find it. We're going to enhance it. And then we're going to pull you back in the bow and launch you into the enemy's heart. And that's that's what we do. That's it. When you come here, yeah. So like I tell people all the time, they're like, so what are you well, doing Doug, now? What's it? Like, what is this whole cigar and sermons? And, and I go, we put brains and balls on believers. It's just that simple. Getting people you saved. Know? We'll start training some leaders. Yep. Well, I can tell you this. You, you've met the leaders of my church and the pastors that are, that are on my team. I trained and ordained those pastors. None of them went to Bible college. Some of them taking some classes online. They all study. They all read. But I trained them. And some people say, I, I, I'm ripping off somebody's quote here. They said uh, about the rapid church movement. They were planning cell groups like wildfire all over Southeast Asia. And they said, oh, my gosh, you can't train and release these pastors so fast. You'll create heretics. And they said, yeah, we can create a heretic in three months. It takes you four years. <laughs> and so... You know, are you going to get people that get it wrong? Yeah, you're going to get people that get it wrong, but that that can. I mean, be look good. again, again, look at um, you know, Christ three years with uh, twelve chuckleheads, sans Judas who killed himself, and then he appears to Paul on the road to Damascus, and so yep. uh, you know, brief brief stint, you know, three years, and and Jesus is like, okay, boys, take over the world, okay? I got to go. They're like, we don't want yep. you to go. No, it's better if I go. Well, we don't think it's better if you go. And he goes, I'm gone. I'm going to send you a helper. Uh, he's the third person of the Godhead called the Holy Spirit. I like to call him the Holy Ghost because it sounds scarier. And he's going to fill you, but you wait until he comes. And then, again, it's not what we bring to the table. It's what God brings to the table. Come on. We just got to be there. Again, like, I'll do it. I'll do it. Use me. You know? Yep. Here's my hands. Here's my energy. Here's my heart. Here's my passion. Here's my brain. Here's whatever. Here's my yes. stick. And God says, you got a stick, Moses? And he shows him that he can do crazy things with our little gifts and what little stuff we bring to the table. Yeah, that's good, man. That's really good. All right, brother. So what does the Warrior Wild Men listener need to do, my friend, my buddy, my pal? Because we need to continue this conversation. We'll continue it because I think it's good. I think it's fruitful. I was even saying my church is a cell church. It's about to be 20 years old in April. And uh, my leaders are going to be listening to this because they need a refresher. We were planted like this. We've been doing it like this. But you have to be reminded of, of the seriousness and the reason that we do these things. We don't do these things because it's some type of strategy. Our goal is to win souls and make disciples. That, that's, that's what our whole life is about, right? And, and we, need to be, we need to be serious about that business. All right, Warriors and Wild Men, go to warriorsandwildmen.com. Subscribe, like us, love us, find us on social media while you can, when you can. But uh, more importantly, Go to warriorsandwildmen.com. We're uh, launching our own servers here in the next few weeks so they can't shut us down and deplatform us. And so you'll always be able to find us there. So you're welcome to follow us on social media while you can. But please make sure you get over to Warriors and Wildmen uh, so we get your email and keep you uh, plugged in. We don't send tons of emails. Um, Doug writes some cool stuff just to keep you updated on what's going on and let you know when the new podcasts come out. And then for those that are, um, you really feel like you want to help us push this message out farther, deeper, wider. Hit the war chest, send us some cash, tax deductible. For those that are doing that, man, we really appreciate it. You guys are helping us get the job done. Mm -hmm. Warriors and wild men. Wild men.